This is pr appropriate, isn't it? You're not trying to try and decide. Do you have trouble making decisions? Well, you know, I, uh, I want to talk about somebody who once responded to this this way. Well, yes and no. It kind of answers the question, doesn't it? Anybody who answers that question this way, you know, has a problem. But um, some questions are, are difficult to answer, and other ones are not. For example, some decisions. For example, let me just share this particular image with you, and uh, you tell me how hard this is. Here is a man who's approaching a sign. <laughs> to the left is the meaning of life, and to the right is the uh, cheese and crackers. Now, I can't go both ways. I'm going to have to make a decision. Yeah, that's a toughie. You can see he's uh, not sure which way to go there. But... Um, some decisions are difficult, and uh, those are the ones, unfortunately, that uh, we're all called to make from time to time. And we are, um, I want to, that's appropriate because that's an introduction to what we're going to look at this morning. You know, uh, if you've been coming to our congregation for a while, you know that we're studying 1 Corinthians, and this may be a surprise to you at this point, but uh, we have now been in first, uh, in just in this one chapter of 1 Corinthians, for no fewer than six weeks. That's the, and we've only gone through 24 of the 40 verses in this chapter. Now, I know some people who are, like to finish things. They like to keep moving, have the sense that they're moving. And uh, I, I, uh, I may have shared this with you before, but for those of you who, who can remember, remember a, 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 a group called Simon and Garfunkel, you remember that? Anybody remember Simon and Garfunkel? My claim to fame is I, uh, in my gym class, I had uh, Paul Simon's brother who was in my gym class. <laughs> All right, but Simon and Garfunkel they did a song called The Dangling Conversation. You remember that one? You read your Emily Dickinson and I, my Robert Frost. We note our places with bookmarkers that measure what we've lost. Why? Because we read and don't gain anything from it. So the idea of rushing through just to get done is a worthless attempt. It's, a, it's actually a waste of time. We don't want to do that when it comes to God's Word. It is so rich and has so much for us. Now having uh, covered the, uh, the first 24 verses of chapter 7, you may recall, and I'm not going to spend time on this, some of the issues, right? You may recall them. Sex versus abstinence, uh, we talked about that. Marriage and divorce, we talked about singleness, and we talked about the value of Jewish versus the value of Gentile, how significant is that? And we finally talked about the, uh, the slave versus free issue, how does that all work? Why? Why, why would Paul be talking about these, this set of issues? If you recall... You recall the reason Paul was addressing this unusual set of issues in his letter to the Corinthians was because the Corinthians were struggling and thought they had an answer of how to elevate their faith beyond where it had become. They wanted to reach a higher spiritual plateau. And they came to the conclusion that this particular approach, the abstinence one, would help them do that. And of course... Paul addresses that because abstinence from sex is not what God designed since he designs people to be married and enjoy sex. That was God's plan. And as you recall, we, uh, we had a lot of fun with that particular one. We had a bigger turnout the following week when we said we are going <laughs> to talk more about sex. But um, So anyway, these were the issues that were covered. Now, today... I don't know if it's good news or bad news here. We're going to finish the entire chapter. That's uh, 16 verses here. And uh, you, some people might delight in that and say, well, yeah, now we're moving along. We'll be in chapter 8. All and man, you know, no, no time at all. You see, uh, 
there are two basic issues that I, uh, I see in, this, in the remaining 16 verses here in chapter 7. The first one is kind of the overview of what those, this whole section is going to talk about, and that is whether it is advisable for, uh, for those who are betrothed or those who are widows to get married. That's, that's what he's dealing with. Remember, and he's dealing with these issues. We'll see why he's dealing with those issues. But the second thing that happens in this chapter, as part of dealing with them, he presents, Paul does, a godly criteria for making big decisions in our lives. He's addressing the, the marriage question, but in the process reveals things about how we as believers should be making important decisions. Anybody here have a decision in their life? Important decisions now and then? Nobody. Um, uh, some of you are awake. Okay, good. Already? I haven't even got very far. Because, uh, you know, making decisions is something we all have to do. Some of them are big. Am I going to get married to this particular person or not? Am I going to take that job? Am I going to move to this new location? Am I, what am I going to do? We all have those questions. And uh, today, as we go through, and we have a lot of verses to cover, so I'm going to move through that today. I am going to actually emphasize this one, the second one, the looking at and extracting the godly criteria that Paul presents for making big decisions in our lives. I think this is something we all need to hear because we all have to do this. So, if you have your scriptures, would like to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning this morning at verse 25. I've broken this up into three blocks of text. So, this, uh, this is actually seven verses here from uh, beginning in chapter 7, verse 25. And uh, we, we see the text here is really interesting because it begins with these words... Now about, and I'm reading, by the way, I, this morning, this is something I don't nor normally do, but there's a reason I'm doing that. I'm going to use the NIV. <gasps> I know, I know, I know. I've been telling you to study the NAS, and it's the better, more literal, and so on. But it's actually a little wooden in this particular area, and I think that uh, we're looking to try to grasp the concepts more than get lost in all of the details. And after having said that very thing, the next thing I'm going to do is introduce some details. Because you see the text that says now, about, and I have parentheses concerning, which is another translation of that, that same uh, Greek word now, about uh, virgins, I want to look at this particular portion of the, of the uh, words because it's significant. You see, this word is actually, uh, the translation comes from peride, which is the Greek word that, uh, that is, means now concerning or now about. And Paul uses this, as we're going to see in a moment here, Paul uses this to do something in his letter. What he's using, these words, every time these words appear, they are markers, a marker that Paul has set in the text, I believe, that indicate he's about to address an issue that was given to him to address. In the letter, we don't have, the letter that the Corinthians sent to him. Remember, he's responding to that. He says about the things, the beginning of the, of the entire book says, now about the things I've heard, but now we get to chapter 7. At the beginning it says, now about the things about which you wrote. Remember that? So now he's addressing the things you wrote, and he says, now concerning. And when he says that, it just, I, I don't know how you cannot see, you can, you, the commentators, some see it, not all do, now concerning, he's, he's looking and says, okay, let me, let me see. Now I'm writing in response to your comment here. Now concerning this, which you said, and uh, that's a marker text. And we found out, I, I shared this one time before, that that appears seven times from here on throughout the, the book of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning, peri day, it appears at the beginning of seven different sentences, and they are, I believe, markers, kind of an outline of what Paul is talking about. We are there at number two, this one, uh, chapter 7, verse 25. Now concerning, he says, now concerning virgins. Why are you talking about virgins now? You know why? Because they asked him a question about it. So he's responding. 
And uh, the tr Greek translation is interesting here because we find out that this word, virgins, actually means young ladies who are betrothed to be married. It's a little awkward, even in the NIV, to constantly refer to them as virgins because in our society we think of virgins in, in something. We don't think of them necessarily as betrothed. In those days, if you were betrothed to be married, you better have been a virgin. Today, I think the opposite is true in the fallen society that we have. And so I'm just going to replace that word, pardon me for doing this in the NIV, with this more modern word, which I think uh, you'll recognize, now concerning or now about fiancés. These are the young ladies who were engaged to be married. Okay, that's a word that I think we all can recognize. And uh, he goes on to say, now, now concerning fiancés, about which you asked, I have no command from the Lord. That's it, I'm done, I got nothing, I got no idea. Is that what he means? Not at all. When Paul says, I have no command from the Lord, what he's saying is, you know what? Yeshua never spoke to this particular issue. So he doesn't have the words of the Lord to share with you. Yeshua didn't speak to every issue in life, did he? He didn't tell me how to do vessel functions. He didn't tell me how to design a wing. He didn't tell us a lot of things. But he gave us principles of life. Paul, he also gave us one very important thing, the Holy Spirit, without which we would be completely lost except for the words that he left us. But with those, we now have access to the mind of God. And Paul is using that when he says, I have no command from the Lord, I don't have his words, but let me share with you, as he goes on to say, but I give a judgment, an advice, something as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. You see that? It's trust, he's trustworthy. This is not just a guess. He's not hazarding a thought. He's not throwing out, well, I, maybe you ought to consider it's my opinion. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the Lord has given this through his spirit to him. He is trustworthy. He repeats this later at the end of the, the whole text. So we can, we, can, we can take what Paul says as coming from the Lord, even though he never heard those words directly from him. Because Paul didn't address what to do with fiancés, apparently. I mean, Yeshua didn't. He goes on to say, because of the present crisis or the distress, I think that it is good for you to remain as you are. Remaining as you are is a phrase he repeats again and again. It's his, to use a, uh, a, a programming term, it's his default starting point. Anybody here write computer programs? A few? You know what a default means, right? Understand that term. It's the starting point. It's what the initial start is. It's, 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 it's the, the place that you begin with. Initially, he says, remain as you are. If you have any questions, remain as you are. But he talks about something in this text, which is fascinating, because he says, because of the present crisis, and I ask, uh, Paul, could you, well, what exactly is this present crisis you're talking about? What, what are you talking about here? What present crisis is there? Well, folks, I, I don't want to bore you with a history lesson, but I want you to understand a little bit about what was going on that, would, uh, um, in, you know, that will inform this particular issue. This was a time frame, you remember, what was going on. First of all, there was a Roman emperor by the name of Claudius who had been emperor, and uh, he was poisoned, to the best of our information, on October 13th in the year 54. Now you say, what? <laughs> What does that mean? We should have Claudius Day on October 13th. No. no. Claudius was uh, poisoned as the, he was an emperor, had been uh, in charge. And uh, guess who took over after Claudius? Our good buddy, not so much, Nero. Now, he became emperor. Notice the date? Same day. He was basically took over Rome immediately. He was right there. They handed it right over to him, the best we can tell. Now, 
he's not known for being the kindest, certainly to the believing community. In fact, just the opposite. If ever there was a, uh, a, a emperor of Rome driven by Satan to take out everything on the believing community, it kind of reminds me of the way Israel is being treated today. You know, the world just seems to condemn Israel for everything. There, in this day uh, was a day when Nero, as time went on, began to condemn the believers, the called Christians, right? The name Crestus came out, and so they were referred to by that. And if it was, as if it wasn't bad enough, when he took the role as emperor, Nero was all of 16 years old. He's high school age. Charge of the entire Roman Empire at that time. Whoops. How'd you, how'd you like your high schooler to be put in charge of, uh, you know, half the world? Yeah, I know. I, uh, some of you have high schoolers, or uh, can you remember when you were in high school, and you'd say, yeah, you know, maybe that's not such a good idea. He was the one who took over. Now, here's another factoid to add to the mix. The book that we call 1 Corinthians, remember it's really second, but it's the one we have. 1 Corinthians was actually written, we think, in late 54. Okay, put these together, what's happening? New emperor, not going to be a friend of the believing community. Very young, taking over. Can you see how this would be a time of distress? I think Paul, through the Holy Spirit, understood what was about to come upon the believing community. They were in for an unusual amount of trouble. And that was the time, that's the environment, the context in which Paul is now writing to the group at Corinth. Okay, so keep that all in mind. He says, I think that it is good for you to remain as you are. And he says, are you married? Don't seek a divorce. You see, are you unmarried? Now is not a good time to look for a wife. It just seems like he's talking to the men. Uh, it's okay. They're the ones who make the decisions a lot of time in this. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if, if a fiancé marries, she has not sinned either. But those who marry, here it comes, will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you from this. Paul is warning What's coming up here ain't going to be a good time to go take a honeymoon. It may not be a good time to be adjusting to life together because you're about to have problems that you did not expect. And what he goes on in verse 29 to say, what I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. Right? Short. It's coming up. He says, what's going to happen? From now on, those who have wives should live as they have none. Oh, really? Well, what does that mean? You'd like to relax and enjoy the time with your wife and just kind of kick back and just ignore the world. Just don't do that. Don't do that. Be careful now. Things are going to start changing around you. He says, those who mourn, you should be as those who did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Why? Those who were buying something as if they were, it was not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as, if, as not engrossed in them. Don't count on whatever you think you normally could count on happening. You see, this world in its present form is passing away. Get ready, believers, there in Corinth. You guys who are comfortable who are worried about raising your spiritual level, you better look out for what is happening around you. You see, uh, wake up, time is involved here. And in fact, this leads into the whole idea of decision making. You remember in John chapter 7, it was, I'll remind you, uh, it was uh, just before Sukkot, and Yeshua, it says, was approached by his brothers who were said, told him, go down to Jerusalem, you know, if you're the Messiah, go show yourself down there. And Yeshua's response was, my time is not yet. The man was aware of time. There was a time for things. That was not the time. How about in, uh, in Galatians chapter 4, I think it's verse 6, where Paul writes, uh, in the fullness of time came, 
God brought forth his son. You remember that verse? At a certain time, when it was appropriate. In Romans 5, uh, chapter, I think it's verse 6, it says, at the right time, Messiah died. Time is, is, is something that God looks at, too, and does things at the right time. So there's a lesson here for all of us by what my first of three criteria here for making decisions. Look around you. Evaluate what's going on. Evaluate the situation in which you're about to make whatever big decision you're, you need to make. Don't just cloister yourself in your little office or home and, and think about what is your major concerns. Look around what's going on about you. Now we move to uh, the verse uh, 32. And Paul says, I would like you to be free from concern. And I'm going to underline this word concern because we're going to see it happening here. I would like you. That's nice of you, Paul. I'd like you to be free of concern. He says, an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But uh, a married man is concerned about the affairs of, his, of, this, uh, of this world because how he can please his wife. He's got to be concerned about that. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned. Notice how this word keeps appearing. An unmarried woman or virgin, that is a uh, fiancé, is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of the world. How could she please her husband? You see, if you're married, you've got two things to worry about. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you. It's not because God is a cosmic killjoy. He isn't but that you may live in a right way with undivided devotion to the Lord. Not something that a lot of us keep at the top of our list, is it, when it comes to making decisions? The end of our book that we're going to get to later in chapter 15, uh, the next to last chapter, the bottom says, Paul uses these words, he says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You may think, you know what? I need to just pull out of this world. I'm just going to go grab a beach chair, head down there, watch the waves, you know, till they turn them off at night. I'm just going to, you know, cool it. Chill out. Let the world worry about its thing. No. That's, uh, that's not what Paul's all about. You see, the second criterion that Paul wants is using as he's giving advice on what, what these big decisions, the second criterion is this one. Consider the impact your decision is going to have on your current ministry. It's not something that's always at the top of our list when we want to make our decisions, is it? We think about number one, maybe number two if we've got a spouse, and we don't often go much beyond that. Paul is saying, you want to make wise decisions that are godly? Consider your current ministry. That, by the way, assumes you are in the current ministry. We'll address that some other time. The last block, beginning at verse 36, Paul says, if anyone thinks he is acting improperly towards his fiancée, and if she is getting along in years and he feels he ought to marry, and uh, he... He should do as he wants, Paul says. Wow, oh, thank you, Paul. He's not sinning. They should get married. Did you notice something when I read this? This is kind of a little trick here. Take a look at that text. There's something that's, that's, that jumped out that's really kind of interesting here. Look at, the, look at these words. If I can get it to do this. Verse one, uh, 36. Thinks, feels, Wants. What's going on? What's Paul saying? Look inside. This is you we're talking about. You're making decisions? Look inside you. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, and the actual Greek word here is his own heart, 
who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will and who has made up his mind not to marry his fiancée, you see, uh, this man also does the right thing. Paul is saying it's fine not to get married if that is what you want. He's not telling you to go against what's on your heart. Does that mean just do what you want? No. Why? So then, he who marries his fiance, he says, does right. That's fine. Good. Marry your fiance. But, let me get this to work here. He who does not marry her does even better. Not bad to get married. It's even better if you're not. He's concerned about them. He wants what's best for them. We've talked about what will drive those decisions earlier. But he wants, you'll know in your heart if it's really, if you're really examining your heart, but there's, there's more here. You see, here's the point. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But he must belong to the Lord. Don't marry out of the, out of the faith. That's important. Well, why, are you talk, why are you bringing this up now, Paul? Why are you telling us to, to examine our own desires? And now you're saying, be careful, though, who you're connecting with, because this person should be a, a believer. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. She's not married. In his judgment, it might be better at this time, considering the distress. And I think that I, too, have the Spirit of God. You see, here's the point in what Paul is saying. He's echoing the thought that Yeshua brought forth, not the words, but the thought, back in John 15, when Yeshua said, I, I am the vine, apart from me, you can do nothing. When you are not connected with him, and you're connected only with yourself, you will not do what God wants. You will do nothing of any use. You must be connected with the Lord. And you as believers, look inside, because he gave you his spirit you want to connect with that spirit when you're making decisions. Criterion number three, before you make a big decision, make sure your connection with God is intact and you have really looked to him. You'll know if you're serious, if you've asked him, if you've given time to pray and talk with him and let him answer you. Don't make the decision hasty. God will give you peace or not about the decision. Three criteria for godly decisions, folks. Three criteria. Number one, almost works here, evaluate the situation around you. Number two, consider the impact to your current ministry. And number three, Almost there, almost there. Confirm your connection with God. Look at those three. File them in your mind. Evaluate, consider, and confirm. These will help you make not just good decisions, but godly ones. Paul wants all of us and the Lord wants all of us to make godly decisions. Next time something, maybe it's right now, something's on your decision list, ask yourself if you're doing all of this. Are you really looking around to see what's going on? Are you really considering what which your decision is going to have impact-wise on, on your own ministry? And are you sure you're in touch with the Lord on it? Have you given him the time? Have you really brought it before him? you'll know. You'll know the answer to your question. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the 
thank you that it's so relevant to our lives. Lord, that we want to know how to do things in this world that are pleasing to you. And yet, Lord, we sometimes don't even look to you for that guidance. How foolish is that? May we be reminded this very morning, Lord, how to make decisions that are really in line with you. You've given us sechel to look around, understand, to evaluate, Lord, how these things impact our, our work for you. And, Lord, that we are in touch, really, with you. Help us, Lord, to remember those three simple things that sometimes we forget. And we know, Lord, that we'll, we'll be making much wiser decisions if we do that. Thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. May you bless our week. May we make godly decisions and wise ones, Lord, even now. And we, uh, we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the thanksgiving. In the name of our Messiah, Yeshua. Amen.